Yemi Cambron is an Atlanta-based artist who became undocumented at seven years old when she immigrated to Georgia from San Antonio, Villalonguin, Mexico. Cambron was named among Atlanta's 500 most powerful leaders from 2021 to 2023, and her most recent mural, Monuments, Atlanta's Immigrants, is part of the art collection at Atlanta's Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Veronica Hogan is the executive director of Atlanta Contemporary, a nonprofit contemporary art center. She has taught at Agnes Scott College, SCAD Atlanta, and the Art Institute of Atlanta, and was named one of Atlanta's 500 most powerful people in 2023. All right, so let's give it up for Yemi and Veronica. Thank you. Are they working? Oh, hi. Testing. All right, I don't know how we follow Soul Food Cypher. What? Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Alex Acosta, you all are amazing. Yami, hi. Hello, it's nice to see you again. Oh, wait, I'll sit over here, hold on. I love you, but I think we should sit far away so we don't mix uh, microphones. How are you? I'm doing great, I'm so excited to be here. This space is so significant for Atlanta. Um, and so it's really exciting to be here having these conversations tonight. Yeah. Yeah. All right. How's everyone in the room? <laughs> Woo! All right. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just dive in. It is such a pleasure to know Yami. And I didn't know her actually when I was an instructor at Agnes Scott. I think we, we were ships passing in the night. But, uh, but I know her now and I deeply admire and respect her work. And so it's an honor to be here and to ask the following questions. We have seven questions and like 20 minutes. Who's gonna keep us honest? Are you gonna keep us honest? Okay, excellent. Uh, so my first question, and uh, Yemi also has images to accompany and she's gonna be clicking us through it. So, uh, Yemi, as I was preparing for this conversation, I spent a lot of time looking at your portraits and I am awestruck by their beauty, strength, and complexity, what compelled you to paint and sketch the faces of those you know? Thank you for that question. Um, I appreciate you asking me about, about my portraits. Um, I think, so for me, growing up in Atlanta, an undocumented Mexican woman, and like that experience of uh, coming of age and transitioning into illegality. That experience was a very challenging and, and painful one. And so uh, when I went to Agnes Scott, actually shout out to Agnes Scott. Woo. Um, that was the first time I really started figuring out how to explore my experience through artwork and so it was it became a form of therapy for me. Um, I was able to take everything, like all the trauma and the fear, and to translate it into a visual language. Um, and these things are really hard to talk about, right? And so this experience for me was very liberating. It gave me a sense of humanity when I felt like there was an entire system that was designed to work against me. And so with portraits, I feel like I'm making an effort. What am I doing wrong? No, you're fine. I'm making, an, I'm making an effort to extend that sense of liberation and that sanctuary that I was able to create for myself, to other people, um, to my family. These are portraits of my parents. Um, and eventually I did start making artwork that depicted, depicted other undocumented people around the country. So I will stop there because I'm very long-winded and I can go on and on. <laughs> so as many of you know, Yami not only paints portraits and of course did an incredible installation at Atlanta Contemporary that we're going to talk about in a minute, but one of the things that I was just struck by when I was doing my research was the fact that Yami calls so many of her murals monuments. And so... It is such a powerful word. What does it mean to you? And why did you choose to not just memorialize 
these individuals, but also craft them as monuments. Particularly, you know, when you're driving through Atlanta and you see these murals, that they are monumental, and these are figures and individuals that you don't, that I don't know, right? These are your friend, family and friends, but why the word monuments? So when I was, again, an undergrad at Agnes Scott, I, I started, I think I titled a piece I did, uh, a video piece I did of my father and one of my brother, I titled them Monumentos Mi Hermano and Monumentos Mi Padre. So Monuments My Brother, Monuments My Father. And so that really came from an instinct to, to honor their humanity, right? And I, I layered their very human, complex, imperfect stories with um, all of these things I was hearing politicians say about undocumented people. And so for me, it was creating this space that was honoring their humanity. Um, and it came from an instinct. And I think that when I had my, uh, the first opportunity to paint a mural in 2017, and, and having that experience of painting their, their faces on such a monumental scale, like it was just fitting to call them monuments. And so in 2018, I painted my first mural titled Monuments, um, Monuments We Carry the Dreams. Sorry, there's three of them. <laughs> and that mural is right around the corner from the Georgia Capitol, which is such a significant location because it's a place where there constantly, every session is legislation that, that is introduced that makes the lives of undocumented people incredibly difficult in Georgia. So it was significant for that reason. Also, when I was in high school, um, my sophomore year of high school, I entered an art contest hosted by the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust. And I got third place. I was supposed to get $50. I was all excited because I was securing the bag with $50. And I showed up at the Capitol with my mom, my little sister, and my teacher was recognized in front of everyone, given an award, given a certificate. And at the end of the ceremony, my teacher went to claim my prize and she was told that I couldn't be awarded the $50 because I didn't have a social security number, right? And so that location then became so, such a significant landmark for me understanding the implications of undocumentedness in Georgia specifically. Um, there were many things that happened after that, and so I think like when I was painting that first mural that I titled Monuments at the front, I was driving that lift across the street from the Georgia State Marta Station to the to the wall, and like just feeling like this was there was a sense of justice here, right? That I was I was turned away, and they still owe me fifty dollars, <laughs> and I would look at the Capitol, and I'm like. I won't tell you what I would do, everything, but, but you know, I, it just, it felt like I was monumentalizing our experiences and our stories and like doing it boldly. Like these are portraits that are looking right at you and they're not afraid and they're saying we're here and we're present, right? And now that I've had like sort of an opportunity to step away from my murals a little bit and I've had five years in Atlanta painting these murals, I painted monuments, our immigrant mothers, Monuments Atlanta's immigrants at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium and um, and all the conversations that surfaced um, even more in 2020 around the monument, I, I, I think I understand there's a different context now to my work. I think it, it really challenges us to think about who is worthy of public celebration yeah. in the state that is the home to the largest Confederate monument in the country, yep. right? So I'll end there. <laughs> end there, we're not done. Uh, so in, in speaking to that, right, there are so many varied and formal elements in Yemi's work. There's color, shape, line, iconography, scale, of course, that your work ultimately becomes transcendent. Are you trying to skip the? I'm trying to click. <laughs> we're clicking, we're it's moving okay. forward. So we were talking about portraits. So this is, uh, these are some of the images, detailed images of the mural at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium's Home Depot backyard. So when I go to the Atlanta United soccer games, I see all the people tailgating mm -hmm. in front of this mural and I'm like, I don't think they get it. <laughs> <laughs> This one's indicator. This is the one that's right around the corner from the Capitol. 
sorry, Monica. I, I, Veronica, I'll let you go. So, you know, the reality is, is that, of course, what Yemi's talking about is that the work transcends, right? It gives voice to the voiceless and name to the nameless. Ultimately, you know, the first instance that I ever met Yemi through was that her work was not just work as an artist, but work as an activist. So what does the future look like for you to continue making art and making change? And we're going to obviously talk about some other pieces, but right? What does it look like? I think that's a tough question because I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that looks like, I think, now in this period of my life where I'm going through a huge trans transition where I feel like, all right, I've done um, this very physical, like, large work in Atlanta and it has depleted me <laughs> in so many ways and it has been beautiful and it has been painful. Like, you know, my, I, I know what I'm exposing myself to when I'm out there and I've, just like I've had beautiful conversations with the public, I've also had really challenging ones. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to find a way to translate what I've learned through murals and through my activism into more of a studio practice um, that will not deplete me. Because at the end of the day, I feel like as activists, we are conditioned to throw ourselves at the fire and to like be out there and put ourselves in the front lines. But if we're destroying ourselves, we can't keep fighting, right? We can't keep taking care of our own families, of ourselves, of our communities. And so if it's not sustainable for me, how can I like, how can I do this work, right? And so I'm trying like desperately to make it sustainable. Um, for me, the murals, I feel there's something that has been bothering me for a minute about them. I feel they are often misconstrued as images of happy and hopeful immigrants and like, yes, right? Because we have to hang on to that to continue. And I felt like I needed to create the spaces I needed to see growing up undocumented um, in, in this state that I call home. Uh, but they're not sufficient to really capturing the, the nuances of our stories and just like everything we have to deal with as human beings, right? Like they don't, to me, they don't, I love them, but I, I feel like they, I want to do work that complicates that immigrant narrative further. And it's really hard to do that in public spaces and with murals when there are layers and layers of stakeholder approval. And when the client wants the colors, they want the happy, hopeful immigrants, but they don't want their stories. And I've had to deal with that. And I just simply cannot exploit myself in that way and then and then on top of that not talk about what the people in my work are going through because like just that they have the courage to out themselves as undocumented and to share their likeness with the world um, in a very anti-immigrant state like that takes a lot of courage and I just feel like it's a disservice to them to not explore all of those complexities so I'm going to grad school, <laughs> hopefully, um, here in the next few months and, and hoping to really dive into that space of what does that even mean? Like, how do I complicate this, this work a little bit more? I'm going off script for a second because something that Yemi said really resonated, which was the idea of care, right? The fact that she is uh, responsible for caring for herself, but also caring for others. How do you, how do you even do that? How do, you, how do you take care of yourself? How do you care for these people who are trusting you and giving you their, their voice and their image? I mean, what, is, what does that even look like? How do you even bridge that gap? I went off script. That's, that's a really, <laughs> I think that's, that's hard to figure out because the needs are, are so, they're ever changing. Right? And so when I was a teacher teaching high school students at Cross Keys High School in DeKalb County, my alma mater, like what care looked like was determined by the students and what they needed, right? And it's like if I have undocumented students in my classroom when 
Trump's administration is rescinding DACA and they're in turmoil, what they need is not for me to teach the standards, right? What they need is for me to address like that pain and the turmoil that they're feeling. And so in those moments as an educator, it has meant like stopping everything and like trying to use the skills that I've learned as an activist to help them feel like they have some sort of control, right? So when Trump rescinded DACA, for example, we organized a here to stay rally and a walkout and the whole school participated. Um, so, and then when um, there was a, a point in time when I was selling stickers on Instagram to raise money for DACA renewals. Uh, DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. I'll let you look it up, because um, it's a long story. I'm a DACA <laughs> recipient, um, and I can talk more about that if we have time. But, um, and then for my family, I think it's, it's really just, um, I, I'm not, I don't, I have, I've had to recognize that I'm not in a place where I can take care of my aging immigrant parents. And so instead, for me, the focus is like figuring out how to make my career sustainable so that I can actually take care of them. And that has meant saying no to a lot of, a lot of things I'd rather be doing. Like I rather, no offense to the people who have been hiring me, <laughs> but I'd much rather be uh, doing work to amplify the movement to shut down store detention center in Georgia than to be <laughs> creating a piece for Atlanta United or the Hawks. Thank you for hiring me if anybody <laughs> here, but you know, it's like I'm, at heart, I'm an activist, and so if I have to take commissions, which I'm great, very grateful to have, to survive, like, I can't do the activism work, right? So I've had to say no to work that has depleted me um, in the past and that has literally made me physically sick. I think when I was doing the, yeah. the piece at the Atlanta Contemporary, w yeah. which was about immigration detention, I, like, threw myself in there, and I was like, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this right and it made me sick. So the day that I had to do my artist talk, I lost my voice and I couldn't speak, right? So like, I think that was my biggest lesson. It's like, I can't, I can't even provide the message, right? If I'm not okay, but um, we created space for other people to share their stories. So yeah. it ended up working out. It worked out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm skipping ahead. So Chingala Migra, so Again, my, one of my charges as the director of Atlanta Contemporary is to basically shut up and let the artists talk, which is what such a privilege is being up here with, with Yami. So I had reached out to Yami to do the site-specific installation at Sliver Space, which is the most challenging project space, I would argue, at Atlanta Contemporary. Um, I would also say that 80% of the artists that we invite to participate in this space tell us no instantly. And uh, Yemi said yes, instantly, which is my favorite thing in the whole wide world. So Chinga La Micra was the site-specific installation at Atlanta Contemporary, and it was so strikingly beautiful, and yet so complex and overwhelming with the story. And I think this, this goes back to something that Yemi was saying about the murals, is that they're they're disarming, right? They're beautiful, they're uplifting, they're powerful, and yet there's so much more to this story. And it's a very, very tiny space. I, I should have told you to put the picture of you guys all, like, Yami was on a ladder, basically hanging upside down with three people under her installing this incredible installation. And they spent hours and days, days, so many days, uh, in this tiny space. So set the scene, right? We invited her to do this incredible installation and we see the images, there were project participants and the stories that you captured, told, memorialized, I mean, and, and honored the nine butterflies. Like, talk us through how this went from an installation to a, a movement. So I wanted to walk you through the process with the images, but I'm having a really hard time. Where do I need to point? It's not working. Ah, okay. Um, can you go back a couple of slides to the, the one where I'm on that ladder? So the space was super tiny. I initially... Look at her. That is her on the it ladder. Was so That's fun. the space. 
I mean, and to go from like the murals to this tiny space was really challenging. But um, initially, I was going to do a piece that was about like this um, this idea of being like. There's a saying in Spanish that's like it's, ni de aquí ni de allá, which is neither from he, neither from here nor from there. But I I say soy de aquí y de allá. Like I'm from here and from there, right? I'm I'm both, and so. I was like, okay, there's two walls that are like in this very confining space. I think I can do something with that binary. And like, as I was checking out, did you know this? No, it's oh. only one minute remaining. <gasps> Y'all, we're gonna keep oh. going. <laughs> <laughs> so as I was um, looking at the space, I think what 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 I what made me shift was that you walk into the Elena Contemporary and this this liver space like you could easily miss it. And at the time I was having conversations with an organization called El Refugio. They uh, serve people who have been harmed by Georgia's immigration detention centers. Check them out on Instagram. Um, and the space really resonated with the stories they were sharing with me because it was this tight, confining space that just reminded me of detention. And you could easily miss it. Like this, the store detention center is in our backyards here in Georgia. It is the largest and most deadliest detention, immigration detention center in the country and it's privately owned by Core Civic, by a corporation, right? And they turn people in and out. Like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop because I'm running out of time. But part of preparing for doing this work was spending time like understanding the stories I grew up scared of the police and scared of ICE because I was undocumented. Um, and that's how, like, inter interactions with the police is how people would get deported for minor traffic violations. And so for me, doing a project about ICE was like facing my, like, legit nightmares. Um, but I knew that I had to educate myself because it was an experience that I had never experienced in my own skin. So I went to the airport and I volunteered with Casa Alterna. We were helping those who were being released this too nice of a word. ICE was, they just pull up in their vans and they dump people at the world's largest and busiest airports. And there's this organization, Casa Alterna, that helps them navigate. There are people who have come from Venezuela, from South America, who have crossed, like, just people from Haiti who have crossed just terrible conditions. And at the end of the day, it was about providing them a, a little bit of humanity after that journey and after dehumanizing immigration detention where they're transported, shackled from ankles to waist to wrists. Um, and I, there's some, I know we are running out of time, but for me, the biggest thing was to make sure that in the piece you could feel like all of that humanity. And so what it looked like for me as an artist was giving all this love and time and attention to each little butterfly. And so all of the 1,966 monarch butterflies in that space were hand cut by me and volunteers and assistants. Um, and then they were bathed in watercolor baths, which I didn't want to make them super bright and beautiful. Um, I wanted them to be muted uh, to, to give that sense of shadow. and. Really, I wanted the number to help people understand that these are like human beings who are actually in that space. We included nine black monarch butterflies to honor the nine people who have lost their lives at Stewart Detention Center. And I ended up inviting someone who survived the detention center to write their names on the wall. And so like that moment where this, this person who lived through a detention through COVID and survived, like wrote those names. I mean, the space just became sort of like, like an, an altar of sorts, right? It was a memorial. And so um, I was, I just couldn't even, um, I was bawling uh, when that happened, but it was important for me to get out of the way and to create space for people who are directly impacted to share their stories. Cause I never experienced it myself. I'm gonna stop. Cause I'm gonna keep talking. Can I ask one more question? One. Ha. Excellent. Okay, so it's, it's my last question for Yami, and it's basically, is there anything that you want to say that you felt you have not yet had the opportunity to do so, not just in this conversation, but in your career? Like, where, where do you go from here? 
I feel like the only answer I have is like, you know, I, I talked about wanting to go to grad school. Um, I've, I've been accepted to the School of Art Institute of Chicago. So it looks like maybe I'll head over Woo! there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a, I, my face looks like a pizza because I'm so stressed out from applying to, to school. Thank you. But um, I, I, th I think what I w the message I'd, I'd love to leave you all with, and thank you for sharing your time w in this session, is that I hope you feel inspired to take this and, and, and to go into your own spaces and like be intentional about creating space for, for, for others. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be immigrants, but I think it's these conversations where we can understand each other on a more human level that really changes things and all you can control is the people that are around you right and like the space that is around you not not you can't control the people but like you can control the conversations that you're having with those you love and so at home you know I'm having conversations with my family about anti-blackness right about it's just like things that I've had the privilege of learning because I have a college education and my parents haven't right so have those conversations with with your coworkers, with your families, and um, you know, follow follow my horn, please. <laughs> um, you know, because I'm I'm constantly like, especially through Instagram, sharing right. like calls to action, sharing information from the organizations that are doing, that are on the ground doing the work. I I feel like I'm I'm just here to amplify, and and that's kind of my job. So, so I think we're done. Yeah. Okay. She gave me the we're done. Thank you, Yamie.